my name is Rory Gagan. I'm uh, Jean-Philippe Kissy. Uh, we want to give a presentation on, go figure, design patterns in Python. So this is going to be a really, really <laughs> active live demo type of stuff. Um, so go ahead. All right, so um, what are design patterns? For over 50 years, of course, um, all you know, code was hard and always hard to write and maintain. Um, almost 20 years ago, um, some guys um, published a book um, in, of design patterns, called, um, the, which um, they called the Gang of Force. You all, know it, you all know of it, you all saw it in college and everything. Um, what are design patterns? Well, they are a small reusable um, piece of code to solutions. Um, I mean, it, <laughs> sorry. All right, so they, they're um, general reusu reusable solutions to uh, problems that um, we, um, we have uh, lots of times um, when we're developing. Um, having design patterns allows, allow us to uh, make, of course, um, testing, unit testing easier because we have um, smaller pieces of codes which are going to be easier to test. And this makes, of course, um, maintenance of code to be really, really easier. So question, uh, begs the question, why Python, right? Um, I had a uh, friend, uh, um, I'm sorry, a colleague in a previous lifetime who said, Python doesn't need design patterns because we have metaprogramming, right? Um, you know, like uh, I've read design, I've read parts of design patterns, and uh, you know, you go through it, and you're like, all right, if you're writing in C++, you're writing in Java, you're dealing with a static type system. This is really handy because it lets you do a lot of uh, a lot of complicated stuff in a very clear and detailed way. I find in, for Python, a lot of design patterns are so, sort of not overkill, but too basic, right? Too where oh, why would I do all this when I could just pass a function around? And it does wind up being like that. But to say Python doesn't need design patterns, I mean, I deal with bad Python code, most of it written by me, day in, day out, right? I mean, it is a classic uh, beginner problem where you get a program of a certain size and you can't make heads and tails. And this is where I think the design patterns we're gonna show you come in, where it's not a question of like this biblical come down with two tablets of, well, we're gonna write our program with this, with this is the design pattern and it's gonna be head to tails. It's, I've got this certain problem, right? I start recognizing that I'm falling into this trap. I start noticing this pattern. Well, maybe if I design my software this way, it'll be a lot easier to write, all right? All right, so um, first off, we're going to be talking a bit about um, um, iterators. Um, you all know about um, our magnificent um, yield keyword in Python, which allows us to uh, have quickly a uh, iterator. What an iterator is, um, it's going to be, um, when you're going to be thinking about, like it says, um, sequence, uh, stream, uh, record set, uh, filtering or pagination, um, it will allow you to uh, read a, um, a piece of data and only allocate this data and use it. So if you're reading a file, for example, instead of putting all the file in memory, you're going to be reading first lines or um, number of bytes each at a time. And by using the yield keyword, you're going to be able to uh, return a, um, uh, a um, generator, which will be used in Python to, uh, of course, um, iterate over it. Um, one of the cool things with yield is um, you can also have a cascade of iterators. Uh, think of it a bit like um, layers of onions, where like you can see um, at the bottom, you can um, like put iterators inside of other iterators, and they will um, they will um, um, yeah. So they will they're going to be using um, each one for each piece of data. So in this example, you're going to have one, two, and three, which is a list. Yeah, it's it's not a it's, it's you have the list, but the first element is going to be one. It's going to be returned. It's going to be multiplied by two, so you're going to have two. And the sec it's going to be applied on the second iterator, which is if n is greater than 3, which is false. So it won't be returning in it. So in the end, you're going to have a, um, a result, which is going to be um, 4 and 6. Um, by um, separating your um, logic um, iterators, uh, it's, of course, going to be really easier to test. Um, and also, don't forget, uh, the iter tool modules that uh, Rory talked about a few months ago has uh, plenty of really amazing um, functions that are really um, going to be useful when you're going to be dealing with um, iterators. Um, yeah. I want to talk about polymorphism over conditions, right? Uh, this is not even a design pattern. I think I'm cheating. This is just more like a tip. 
But this is so useful. Um, you know, if there's something, uh, if there's one way to distill, uh, what now, five years of professional software writing, I can into three words, polymorphism over conditionals. Uh, what, how can I explain this? Right, just, just to give you a bit of hints, if you ever get into a situation where you're thinking, all right, I'm using a lot of instance, is instance here, I'm using a lot of ifs, I have a huge tree, right, or conditions, start thinking about polymorphism and conditionals. Uh, these sound like very complex words, but it's actually a very simple technique. You can go to the next slide. Right, this is a classic piece of code, right? Uh, my boss comes over to me one day and says, I need to do, f I, uh, write something that does this, right? And I write a class, foo, and it does this, and it does it in three steps and it does this, and it does this for y, and that's very simple. He comes to me the, the next week, right, and he says, the, the thing that does this works great, but we just needed to do that in these specific conditions, right? Just, you know, bolt it onto the code, make it really fast, because you don't want to rewrite your code twice. You don't want to copy-paste. So you say to yourself, all right, if I'm in condition A, which was the original one, I'll do this. If I'm in condition B, which is this once, uh, once in a blue moon corner case, I'll do that. And you start peppering all your code with these if else's, if lf, uh, lf conditions, and, uh, and you start wondering to yourself, this is really long. Also, do notice, right, you ha I have condition A and condition A here, right? Nothing stops me from making an error at one day, committing a change from condition A, changing it a bit, but forgetting to make the second change up there, right? And suddenly I added a bug in my code because there is code deduplication in this case, right? The simpler solution is this. Right? Um, it's a lot more code, I'll already admit that, but it's a bit simpler, I find, in my conceptualization. So you do original class foo this, and what does foo this do? It does this. Um, and then I need another class to do that, and I'll call it foo that. And foo that extends foo this, so the do z part, it'll do it again, but because I know that the do x part is different from my foo this, well, I'm saying foo this and that a lot, um, I know it to change it just here. Now, the key here is uh, what's called a constructor method, I guess. Um, I like using it as class methods because it's stuck to the class, and I'm like, oh, this, this method creates classes of this type, right? You can have it as a function laying down in the module. Uh, you can have it whatever you want. You can have it as a dictionary following some types. But the key here is your conditions appear only once. They appear in this class method when you get instantiated, right? So when you ex uh, uh, so what this does is I'm calling foo pick a class, depending on my conditions. I can pass those as arguments to pick foo class, right? So I can clearly outline what is the difference between this and that. And then from that class that's been picked, I instantiate an object and do x, do y, and hopefully do z. Um, so the key here is my conditions are executed once. I'm checked once. Once I've instantiated a class, those conditions always hold because I'm never re-executing, -exec right? So if I have an instance of foo that, it's always this method that's getting called, never that, right? So debugging becomes a lot simpler because I need just to check that this method works. Uh, next. All right, next one's gonna be um, strategy pattern. Um, this one um, is really close to uh, dependency ingestion we have in, uh, we have in Java uh, without all the magic stuff that goes with it. Um, when we're doing a strategy pattern, we have like a controller which, and we have um, different strategy um, that, are going to be, uh, um, that are going to be used by the controller. Um, so when we're going to be talking about uh, strategy, we're going to be thinking about, like it says, operations or uh, handlers or like uh, Rory wanted to say, uh, bring your booze where you uh, bring your own implementation. Um, instead of doing some uh, duct typing, um, with a strategy pattern, it's gonna be a bit easier to, um, to test with your uh, unit test um, because you really um, isolate your um, strategy wh which is going to be implemented. And of course, uh, each strategy is gonna be different, but it's gonna, be, uh, it's gonna provide a common uh, interface to the controller which is going to be used. So a small example that we have, um, let's say the CSV module have a writer um, method, and all it takes is a, um, uh, an argument to where it's going to be written. Of course, you don't want to be uh, writing um, for uh, each uh, different uh, strategy. So the first one is only the standard output. The second one is going to be the file you open and you write. And the third one is the um, string buffer. Uh, by, um, by separating your uh, strategy, um, each piece is going to be, um, it's gonna be uh, implementing what it has to, to do. And 
Yeah, so the, the CSV, right, the CSV doesn't care uh, what, is, what um, strategy it is given as long as it can write, uh, well, it can execute the, for example, write method that each one um, is um, implemented. Uh, one of the things to uh, be careful is um, leaky abstractions. So let's say that uh, you have a flush uh, method in your um, CSV module, but the flush, you don't really have to flush, for example, a uh, buffer uh, string. You have to do it for the, uh, the file and the, um, the standard output. So instead of just raising uh, an exception when you do um, a flush on the third, uh, third method, um, this has to be given to uh, the uh, strategy, which is going to be a stub with a no op uh, to, to make sure that you don't, you don't have an exception that goes with this. Transaction is where uh, you will have an object and you'll have operations you'll do on that object. And each operation you want to, first of all, condense into either a method or an object itself that'll describe, that'll be self-executing, and you want to catalog them and keep them, right? So what you do is your object doesn't have a state. All it has is a list of operations to execute on that state and to get back up to the, the, the current state, you go through your list of operations and execute them one after the other. This is a lot of hoops and a lot of, uh, and a lot of tiger tamers for, one, for, for a couple of useful reasons. First of all, um, you keep this audit log, right? You can tell what has been executed on this object. And if you keep tracks of timestamps and maybe users, you, you can use this to, prove, to, to, to debug, to figure out, all right, I had this object. It was in state this last Monday, and nowadays in the database it's in state Y. What happened? Oh, I have this transaction log. So whenever you're thinking, you hear, oh, I need to keep an audit log. I need to implement undo, redo, right? What's undo? Remove a, tr a transaction from the log. What's redo? Re-add it back again if it didn't have to be. Merging data, a lot easier if you have this log of transactions that you can fight one by one, or uh, controlling versions. So if you want to go to the uh, next slide. Uh, here you have a very simple bank account, which is the classic uh, transaction type of thing, that you do not keep, like, a bank account of somebody is not just a value, it's uh, incoming money and outgoing money, right? So here we keep this log as, I have this object, this list calls uh, trans, which is just an empty list right away. Initially, your, your bank account is empty when you create it, and every time you deposit, you add an amount, and every time you withdraw, Every time you deposit, you record, I have deposited such an amount. And every time you withdraw, I record, I have a withdrawal of this amount. And to get the current balance, it's not a fixed number, right? So it's not optimized to find my current balance. I have to go through the list of transactions and sum it up to figure out what my current balance is. However, uh, this has two useful uh, uh, benefits. First of all, you can keep, if you start recording timestamps and users, you can start, you can tell people when have they withdrawal, when have they deposited. If you make errors, you can go backwards because you just truncate that transaction log, the, tra the trans list, and remove the wrong uh, transactions. And um, arguably, uh, depending on your underlying data structures and whatnot, this is very read slow because you have to recalculate the sum, but you can cache to cache stuff uh, to try and make it faster, but it's arguably write fast, because all you're doing is appending to a log. So if you have a database, it goes really fast. That's it. All right, next one's gonna, we're gonna be talking about the uh, pub sub pattern, uh, publish subscribe. Um, this one is a derivative of the uh, observer pattern, uh, which you see uh, most in a uh, GUI application with an um, MVC, so the model view controllers, where your view is gonna be um, listening to your uh, controller when your, uh, your data change, uh, it notifies your view. Um, the difference with the PubSub pattern is um, we have a central broker, which is managing um, the listeners and uh, the emitters, so the subscribers and the publisher. With a PubSub pattern, you're going to be thinking about like, uh, yeah, message, message queue, uh, subscribe, or even callbacks. Uh, with um, the pub sub pattern, it's uh, as you can see here. It's uh, easier. This is the um, on your uh, on your left. This is the uh, observer pattern where you have your listeners and your emitters. Um, so those three listeners are connected to these emitters. If this one has to be disconnected, you have to notify the three listeners that you're gone. Uh, and with the bro with the uh, pub sub pattern, because of a central broker. If, uh, let's say, this one um, goes out, uh, only the broker has to be notified, and the listener do don't really care to uh, who they are connected. So it's, uh, it's easy to swap up uh, listener or emitter. 
uh, we have a naive um, implementation here where your broker, you're going to have your list of subscribers and publishers. Uh, each are going to be subscribed by either the publisher or the subscriber. And when you want to, uh, when the publisher wants to publish a message, um, so all it does is it iterates over um, those who are subscribed, su subscribed and they're going to like push the message. Of course, this is, uh, like I said, it's naive. So usually you're going to want to have maybe some uh, identification to your um, subscriber and your um, publisher so that your uh, broker can filtrate um, the, me uh, the message so it doesn't have to, um, to, um, to give it to, um, to all the, the subscribers. I want to talk about the state pattern. Um, I put this pattern in just so I can say automaton in front of people because I really like that word. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if y'all remember your theoretical computer science class, I really liked it, uh, where you learned about finite automaton, right? Um, so wh what this is, when you're thinking about, uh, whenever you deal with a problem dealing with state, with uh, workflows, it's very useful. Uh, if you have different modes reacting to the same sort of interface or the same thing, but in different modes you have to uh, spread out, you should start thinking about the state pattern. So uh, the key of the state pattern is before you start implementing it, you sit down with a piece of paper and you name, you list all your states and you list all the potential inputs. So not inputs like a mouse, uh, like, a, like a keyboard, input like my user clicked on this button, my, we got this string in on this port. So specific import, inputs that are useful to your application that usually represent actions or, 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 or operations, right? And, and the point is, you draw your states, and you draw, line, uh, you draw arrows between them representing inputs, okay? So in this case, this represents, uh, I stole it from Wikipedia, it represents a turnstile, right? So your turnstile, all auto automaton have a start state, this, in this case represented by a black dot. You start off locked. The turnstile is locked, right? If you push the locked turnstile, it stays locked, right? If you put a coin in the turnstile, Boop, it goes unlocked, right? If you put another coin and the turnstile's nice, it'll return you the coin, but it'll still stay in the unlocked state. And if you go through the turnstile, it'll go back to locked, right? Um, you want deterministic finite automatons over non-deterministic finite automatons. What the heck does that mean? It means that your system here, so your series of states and inputs and actions, right? So the arrows. All potential, all potential states need to react to all potential inputs. You don't want this gap of, oh, you can never, we'd be in this state. Who would give that input to this state? Trust me, a user will figure out how, and when that happens, you'll get an ugly error message. So remember, in, a, in, a, in an automaton, error can be a state. You can have the error state. If you have a bad input to a certain state, it can either, in this case, it goes back to the state, or it can go to an error state, and the error state is send an email to the administrator, pop up an error box to the user saying, what you try to do here is not allowed, or uh, revert them to an FAQ or something, right? But the important thing is every state should respond to all potential inputs. If you go to the next slide. Uh, ooh, if you could read that. Uh, this is the implementation. So uh, there's a class called locked, which is locked off the top there, and unlocked, right? And the way I like to implement it usually is that the, uh, the state passes back itself an implementation of your of its current state, if you stay in that state, or the next class onwards, right? So all you're doing is you're instantiating state and doing operations onto it as you go along. So if you look at locked, if you pass, uh, if you push on locked, it returns self because you're in the same state. If you put a coin, which is an input, it returns an instance of unlocked and you just move on, and you moved on to the next state, right? And to see the current state, to so figure out what state am I currently in the system, it's just the name of the class, and there's no way of confusing two states, or of, of, being, of thinking, oh, I thought I was in this state, but the code is reacting as if it was in another state. Uh, and it's a relatively simple and very easy to test, because all your states are one class, and you just hit all the states with their inputs and your expected operation on that state. And um, that's basically it. I hope this was uh, this is good. This is just a very short uh, zoology of very few design patterns, which I've uh, which I found uh, useful in Python. So um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.